Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 Welcome again this morning. Let's see. We're moving through this year pretty fast, right? It's already May, almost June. But I'm thankful to God that we're, ch we're seeing the change of the seasons and it's getting warmer. Some might say too warm, too fast, but we'll take it in stride and just enjoy each day as it comes because it is a gift from God. Amen. 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 Now we will have our comments from uh, from Kathy. Good morning, Elder State family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful day in our neighborhood. Good morning. And although it may be a wee bit hot, it's a reminder that the fun days of summer are you know almost upon us. And to be perfectly candid, it could be raining cats and dogs, and I could still stand up here with a big smile because, in fact, I've been on cloud nine since last Sunday when my son and his wife Bailey announced that they're expecting a baby in November. <laughs>
obviously a beautiful, wonderful family. We're going to sing, I am thine, O Lord. Turn to him, number 419, please. We're going to sing all four stanzas as you come to your feet. And I want you to pay attention to the words. How many of you want to draw nearer to the Lord? We're going to do that. Some churches, some congregations don't sing the song the way it's meant to be. They sing, draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord. But the hymn writer says, draw me nearer, that's the ladies, nearer, blessed Lord. And the men are our foundation. Strong. Strong. We'll sing, draw me nearer, 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 three of them, blessed Lord. So we're going to do that as we sing all four standards.
to join with any other concerns? Let us bow our heads. Gracious Lord, this morning, we're in your house of worship once again. We're in this, your house of prayer, praising and thanks, being thankful for all you've done for us this year. Being thankful for the blessings you've shared with us this day. For being humbled by your love, your grace, and your mercy for our lives. We thank you this morning. We thank you for this day that we are able to see and Lord, we know that at the conclusion of this day, we shall never see it again. But we're thankful because you have allowed us the blessing, the privilege to see this day and everyone that is here at some of this morning. We thank you for our family, this family of believers, this body of Christ here at Baldwin's Gate. We thank you for the families represented and we thank you for continuing to send us to this place that we may continue to lift you up. Praise your holy name and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Gracious Lord, this morning we're thankful for all of the joys that have been shared this morning, those spoken and unspoken. We thank you for the gift of marriage and we thank you for the gift of continuing to have so many anniversaries, but each day is a gift. We thank you for the blessings. Lord, we thank you for even yes, the concern because it allows us to share one another's burdens as it's been shared. We are allowed to bear one another's burdens and share one another's sorrows and lift each other up in those moments in time where we may feel a little bit down. We thank you for the gift of those believers that can continue to bear and shore one another up. Gracious Lord, we pause because we just want to thank you for all that you've done for us. Not just some, not just a few, but all of the blessings, all of the gifts. The gifts of our families, the gift of our friends, the gift of this place, this body. We thank you for the blessings of our homes. We thank you for the blessings of all the resources that we have need of. Because they have been supplied to us. Lord, we know. And without you, where would we be? Without you, what would we be and who would we be? But because of you, we are yours. We are your children. We are the children of the most high God. We thank you this morning. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the perfect gift given to us, not only for a season, but throughout eternity. But as that season was, he came down and dwelt among us. He shared his life, his love, his laughter with us. And he continues to share all of these gifts with us today. We thank you for the lesson that he taught. And we're grateful to the one who asked, Lord, teach us how to pray because he taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand up, shall we? Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. We will sing in all four stanzas. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. I first started playing piano at age eight. And this is, I was classically trained, but this is the very first hymn I learned by heart. Yay! So we're going to stand up, stand up for Jesus. <laughs>
Let us continue to keep in prayer those who are in our community, those who are in need around us, those that we may happen to see every day. But we may not know what their needs are, but as we pray and we know that God does, God will continue to bless the giver as well as the gift. Let us come forward at this time as we give unto the Lord.
How in the world can you love someone who wants to do you harm and tear you down? It's much easier for me to love people who already love me. And I don't have any trouble loving my children. They're a part of who I am. I take care of them and have a genuine interest in seeing them grow up to be good, productive citizens. And they, they think they're grown now because of their age, but they're still grown. Yeah. Now, there are times when we all get on each other's nerves. There are times when we have arguments with one another, but at the end of the day, we still love each other. But Jesus comes along and tosses in this curve of saying that not only are we to love those who love us, but we are even supposed to love those who don't love us. Many of us read that and think, are you kidding me? You couldn't be further from the truth. I'm not doing that. I don't have time in my life for people that don't love me. How many times have we heard that? How many times have we said that? This illustration may help us see more clearly what I'm sharing. There was this summer evening in this town called Broken Bow, Nebraska. And this weary truck driver pulled his rig into an all-night truck stop. The waitress had just served him when three tough-looking, leather-jacketed motorists of the Hells Angels type decided to give him a hard time. Not only did they verbally abuse him, one grabbed the hamburger off his plate, another grabbed some of his fries, and, and the third one picked up his drink and began to drink it. How would you respond to this? Well, this is what you do. This is, well, this trucker did not respond as one might expect. Instead, he calmly rose, picked up his check, walked to the front of the room, put the check and his money on the cash register, and he went out the door. The waitress followed him to put the money in the till and stood watching out the door as the big truck drove away into the night. When she returned, one of the bikers said to her, well, he's not much of a man, is he? She replied, this is what she said. I, I don't know about how much of a man he is, but he sure ain't much of a truck driver. He just ran over the three, three motorcycles on his way out of the parking lot. <laughs> I have to say I'm guilty. I might have done that myself. <laughs> not sure. I'd like to think I could do it all, but I'm not so sure. That sounds like justice, doesn't it? When someone wrongs us, our first instinct is to get them back. Our first instinct is to make them hurt as much as they hurt us. That is the world's answer to being wrong. But Jesus gives his followers a different response that they're supposed to have. He tells us we're to love our enemies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In our text, we see Jesus sharing with his followers how they are to respond to those who are their enemies. Now, some of us might think, I don't have to worry about this because I don't have any enemies. Mm -hmm. Just to be truthful, if we don't have any now, we are going to have some at some point in our lives. It's one of the unfortunate things in life that there are some people who are never, ever going to like us, no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how are we going to respond to people like that? Mm -hmm. Jesus answers that question for us today. This section of scripture is known as the Sermon on the Mount, which is recognized as the greatest sermon ever preached. And it's in this section where Jesus lays out the foundational truths. And one of the foundational truths of the faith is that we are to love our enemies. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. That's a bizarre and a hard teaching to listen to. So the question we're going to answer is, how am I supposed to love and respond to my enemies? Jesus shared, shared with us three responses that we're to have towards our enemy. The first response we're supposed to have towards our enemy is, do good to those who hate you. Do good to those who hate you. Don't think it's too hard to imagine this was a teaching that was totally foreign to the society of his day. It's even foreign to our society as well. But even the religious leaders were confused by this teaching of Jesus. The rabbis were teaching at this time, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
Makes sense to me. My guess is most of us would be pretty good at following that law. It doesn't take any supernatural power to do that. Jesus said in verse two, 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Mm -hmm. Even sinners love those who love them. Mm -hmm. When Jesus calls us to love those who hate us, he's calling for us to do something that's totally contrary to our human nature. Human nature tells us to get revenge. Human nature tells us when someone messes with us, we're going to lay down the hammer on them. The thought is if we get them back, they'll know not to mess with us anymore. Plus, we think that revenge is sweet, that it's going to make us feel better. But guess what? Hatred is a terrible tool that literally destroys us. It destroys us physically. Scientific studies have been done to show the damage hatred does. Anger causes our blood pressure and our breathing rate to increase, which causes a strain on our heart, making us more susceptible to heart attacks and strokes. That's what anger does. It also can trigger headaches. It can break down our immune system and, and cause us to be susceptible to various diseases. Hatred can also destroy us emotionally. It wears us out and makes our judgment less effective, leading to bad decision making. Oftentimes, the result of hatred is outbursts that can cause us to be embarrassed. This can lead to feelings of guilt and depression. Another side effect is always being angry and having intense hatred is not, is not because that we would prefer to do this, but we don't seem to be able to help ourselves in that case. It's that we cannot even enjoy the people that are around us that do good for us. Of course, hatred destroys us spiritually. We're told throughout the Bible that the essence of God is love. And if we are harboring hatred in our hearts, then we're living contrary to God's command to love each other. The result of that is a disconnect from God. God has 10 commandments and so many other laws broken down into two statements. Love the, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Psalm 66 and 18 it says, if I have sin in my heart, God will not hear me. There are probably a lot of us who feel disconnected from God who feel distant from God because we're harboring things in our lives that aren't supposed to be there. Have you ever noticed when we're angry at someone, it's because it becomes the focus of our lives. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. Our thoughts and our focus are totally upon that person who is wrong with us. So how can we gain freedom from being in prison by anger? As a friend taught me one time, how can I evict the person that's in my head? Jesus said that it's by doing good to those who hate you. Mm -hmm. One thing we all have control over is how we're going to respond to something. And if we make the choice to respond to those who hate us, to those who are angry at us by doing good to them, we are going to diffuse a tense situation. For one, it will totally confuse the one who hates us because they're expecting us to respond as they have responded in anger. It will also diffuse some of the anger that they have toward us because now they wonder, well, how can I rectify this because I may be overreacting. It's really hard for someone to continue to hate us when we do them good. Mm -hmm. Kindness and love change people. Mm -hmm. In practice, Here's what this would mean for us. Mowing the lawn of a hateful neighbor. Volunteering to fill in for the mean-spirited co-worker who drives us nuts. It may mean providing for a parent who was mean to us as we were growing up. But this is what it means to do good to those who hate us. And if we do these things, we will be surprised by the freedom that we feel from not being tied down to the anger we have. The anger that we have toward those who do, who've been mean to us. 
who've done us wrong. We may even be surprised by the impact we have on the life of that person. Abraham Lincoln said he destroyed his enemies by loving them. How many enemies have we destroyed like that? Second statement that comes out of this from Jesus. Bless those who curse you. We've all heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. I'm here to tell you that that's an absolute lie. There are too many things that carry more power in life than the way we communicate with one another. The Bible tells us over and over again the great power that's in our speech. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Unfortunately, it's so much easier for us to, to use our speech in a negative way than a positive way. It's so much easier to lash out at people than it is to use our speech to build them up. But when we choose to use our speech to lash out at people who've harmed us or hurt our feelings, all we're doing is throwing gas on a fire. All we're doing is rubbing salt in a wound. All, and, and we all know that what happens when you put salt in a cut, it hurts, it stings. And it seems to go on forever. It typically, it typically causes a bad reaction. That's one reason Jesus tells us that one of the best ways to respond to our enemies is by blessing them. As a matter of fact, a kind word, a word of encouragement, can actually remove the anger a person has towards us. Proverbs says a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I really believe most of us probably would have fewer enemies if we learned how to speak in a way that built people up instead of tearing them down. Harsh words put people in a fighting mood. Kind words soften their spirits. Let me give you this example. Christian lady owned two prize chickens that got out of their run and, and they, they busied themselves in the garden of the person next door, this rather grouchy neighbor. This person was so ticked off when he, he saw the two hens, so he ran out, caught the hens, and wrung their necks and threw them back over the fence. As you can imagine, the woman was quite upset, but she avoided her urge to get angry and rush over and scream at the man. Instead, she took the birds, dressed them, plucked the feathers, and prepared two chicken pot pies. Then she delivered one of the freshly baked pies to the man who had killed her chickens. When she handed him the chicken pot pie, she apologized to him for not being more careful about keeping her chickens in her own yard. Her children, expecting an angry scene, hid behind a bush to see the man's face and hear what he would say. But the man was absolutely speechless. The chicken pie and the apology filled him with a, a burning sense of shame, and he apologized to her for reacting so harshly. Next time you see a person who just automatically ticks you off, think of a kind word or a deed to share with them. And do it because... We want to be more like Christ. Amen. And I think we will be surprised at how good we will feel for doing it and surprised by how the person reacts. The third thing that Jesus wanted to share through this Sermon on the Mount was pray for those who mistreat you. Have you ever discovered that those people who mistreat you have a way of dominating your thoughts? Not only do they physically abuse you, but they can also mentally abuse you because it's hard to get our minds off of what they've done to us. When it says pray for our enemies, Jesus is referring to praying for their hearts to be changed. We may not pray, be able to pray for them to, to physically change or to do something differently in that moment. What has been done has been done. But if their hearts are changed, Maybe the next person will not receive the terror that you may have received. The best thing we can do is pray for them. To pray that God will deal with their heart and bring change. To pray that God will deal with our hearts not to be so irritated with them. Do we realize it's in our nature to be at odds with God? To, to be his enemy? 
But in spite of this fact, Jesus has sought to love us anyway. In Romans 5, 8, it says, In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How are we going to respond to our enemies? With love or with hatred? Remember, a kind word turns away wrath. But most importantly, loving our enemies demonstrates in a powerful way that we belong to Jesus Christ. When we love our enemies, we're saying to the world, and, and Jimmy reminded me so eloquently, we remind the world that yes, though we may be hypocrites, we're trying to do the right thing. So many, so many people in the world see church members as hypocrites. See, what did those people do? Why would I be in church when they're doing the same thing I'm doing? But when we show love to our enemies, we're saying, I'm not like those. I'm like the one who came before, the one who gave his life for me, the one who loves me so much that he said, I am willing to lay my life down and be stretched wide on the cross for you. Are we really supposed to love our enemies? Of course, yes. And God, through Jesus Christ, gives us a roadmap in how to do this. Love your enemies. Do unto them as you would have them do unto you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Pastor Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 is one of my favorite many scriptures. Yes, love your enemies. Do good to them who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who disciple who use you for my name's sake. Amen. Thank you for that time to sermon. Sermon to come. Okay, everybody, let's stand, please. And say, lead on, O King Eternal. We'll sing all three stanzas of hymn number 580.
that the world may see that we are yours and we follow you everywhere that you would lead us. We thank you for leading us to the path of righteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.